Well, we have been in this series called The Gospel of John. How many of you guys have been enjoying this series? I love this gospel. I love John's unique perspective. I love the way that he sees the Christ. I love what John brings to the table. And as a people, we have been journeying through this gospel together, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, because we believe that Jesus wants us to experience a fresh encounter with him. He wants us to experience more of who he is and wants to be in our lives. And the manner and method through which he wants to do that is through the gospel. It's through what we call good news. The good news about what Jesus has done in and through his work, his life, his ministry, his cross, his death, and his resurrection and ascension. And so tonight we're going to pick up where we left off two weeks ago with John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Last week, we rushed ahead to John 3, and Pastor Jim and I did a little tag team preach. How many of you guys enjoyed that? I know I enjoyed following the master himself, the sensei, uh, my Jedi master, Pastor Jim, also known as my father-in-law. And I love every time that he comes, because I just believe he brings uh, such a powerful word and presentation of not only who Jesus is, but who he wants to be in our lives. And it was so good to be able to do that last week. How many of you guys enjoyed that celebration service? Still dreaming about those Sonoran hot dogs? Yeah, the good ones with the jalapeno sauce. That was pretty awesome. But um, tonight we are going to actually rewind a little bit and we're going to go back to John chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, go there with me. And we're going to begin right there in verse 13. And here's what it says. The Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons. And the money changers were sitting there. And making a whip of cords, Jesus drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who were selling pigeons... Take these things away from me. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has consumed me. What is John referring to here when he remarks that the, dissemble, that the disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me? He's pointing us and the reader and a very Jewish audience to a very well-known psalm, Psalm 69, verse 9, and I want to read it for us tonight. It's a very specific psalm. It's a psalm of David, and here's what it says, Psalm 69, verse 9, for zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen upon me. Now, before we get to the meat of the message tonight, I want to start with some biblical definitions, and I want to look at the Hebrew word used here for zeal, because I think it's actually really important for us to understand. The word zeal in the Hebrew is the word kana. Say it with me, class. Kana. That was pretty good. And it means to have a jealous passion for something or for someone. We see it all throughout the Old Testament. We see it in relationship to a husband having zeal for his wife, being jealously passionate for his wife. Husbands, how many of you guys know it's good to be jealously passionate for your wife? Not of your wife, but for your wife, amen? We also see it used in conjunction with the jealous passion that the Lord has for his people. All throughout the book of Isaiah and all throughout the Old Testament, it talks about the zeal that the Lord has for his bride, for his people Israel. He's jealous and passionate for his people. And then, of course, we see it in conjunction with the jealous passion that the people are called to have for their God. Here in this Psalm of David that Jesus' disciples are remembering and that the writer of the Gospel of John, John, is pointing us to, David is saying, I'm jealously passionate for the house of God. I'm, I'm jealously passionate.
compassionate for the place where God's spirit resides, where his presence abides. In other words, I'm completely zealous for it. Listen to what the full context of Psalm 69 presents us with. Beginning in verse 7, it says this, For it is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. David is lamenting what has happened to him in this moment. He goes on to say in verse 8, I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. In other words, I'm in some trouble. (laughs) I'm in a difficult place. And then verse 9, for zeal for your house has consumed me and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. In other words, people that insult you, God, are insulting me now. Verse 10, and when I wept and I humbled my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. And when I made sackcloth for my clothing, I became a byword to them. And I am the talk of those who sit in the gate and the drunkards make songs about me. When was the last time the drunkards at the local pub sang songs about you because of your faith? I don't think any of us can say that we have ever had anybody insult us in that way. But here, the, the tale of David's misery has gotten out. And even the drunks are singing and mocking him. Even his friends and those that were closest to him have turned their back on him. This is what David is saying. He's saying that he's so consumed with zeal, with jealous passion for the house of God that people are mocking him and insulting him and have come against him and even the town drunks are making fun of him. So here's what I want to say. Don't be surprised when people do the same to you and to me. When they don't understand your zeal, when they don't grasp your jealous passion for the things of God. Don't be surprised when people despise you because of the zeal that you have for the Lord. And right now, church, we're living in a time, in a season, and in a culture where it's really easy to make fun of the innocent things. It's really easy to look back on what the church did 10 years ago and mock it. It's really easy to look back on what the church did 20 years ago and mock it. It's really easy to look back on what the church did in the 80s and 70s and 60s and go, oh, look how silly they were. But don't lose sight of the zeal that people have had for the Lord. And don't allow others to despise you for the zeal that you and I are called to have as well. You see, David's life was marked by the zeal that he had for the house and presence of God. David lived for it. He longed for it. He thought about it. He prayed into it. It was always on his mind. We see it most vividly in his quest to bring back the ark of the presence of God to Jerusalem. According to the book of Samuel, the ark had been captured by the Philistines following their defeat in the battle of Ebenezer. It then spread havoc in Philistine cities. We, we hear the story of, of Dagon the Philistine idol that kept falling to the ground because the the ark of God was in its midst. And then we see it return to Beth Shemesh. And then from there, it's taken to Kiriath Jerim. And then finally, it's brought back to Jerusalem, otherwise known as Zion, otherwise known as the city of God, the city of David. And you may or may not remember this scene, but for those of you that are familiar with your Bible, you'll know exactly what I'm about to say. But in 2 Samuel chapter 6, we get a picture of David bringing the ark back zealously into the city of Jerusalem. And here's what it says in verse 1. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000 of them. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts who sits enthroned upon the cherubim. And David, verse 5 And all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord. Last week, we spent some time celebrating before the Lord what God has been doing in the life of Courageous Church over the past two years. And here David is with 30,000 men celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. They're rejoicing and they're making an exuberant sound before the Lord. Verse 12, so David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. 
And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. He gave his best every six steps of the way. It's amazing. And then verse 14, the one that we all remember. And David danced before the Lord with all of his might. And he was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. You see, the queen didn't understand David's zeal. And as I've already made mention of it, people aren't going to understand your zeal. They're going to miscategorize it. If you say that you're a Jesus follower in 2021, you're going to be given a label of a bigot and a hater. You're going to be looked down upon for the things that you believe and confess and profess to believe. So don't be surprised when people do that to you because they did it to David. And they did it to Jesus. And so here... Jesus is in John chapter 2, and it's Passover week. They're celebrating what God did in the Exodus moment, which means that everybody is making their pilgrimage to Jerusalem to go to the temple because that's what you did at Passover. And they would go to the temple. They would go to the house of God. And Jesus and his disciples are there, and they enter the temple. And what does Jesus see? What does Jesus encounter coming into the temple. He sees the house of God being made into a place of commerce, into a place of business, into a place of trade. The cattle ranchers are there. The pigeon farmers are there. The money changers are there. And they're all conducting their affairs. So what does Jesus do? Does he gently encourage them to leave? Ah, oh, shucks, guys. <laughs> This isn't a good time or place. Do you think you could take your business somewhere else? Did he ask his disciples if, he checked, if, if they would check on their, their permits? Did he, did, he, did he apologize and say, oh, I don't want to disturb you. I, I'm so sorry to bother you, but do you think you maybe might want to do your business elsewhere? No. What does Jesus do? He fashions a whip. Jesus, the whiplasher, not a title that we often celebrate or sing about, but here he is making a whip of cords, which means it's multi-stranded, <laughs> which means that he didn't go and find one that was laying around, which means that he took time to think through what he was going to do. Imagine it with me. Jesus comes into his own temple that his father gave the plans for. And he takes the time to deliberately and intentionally, piece by piece, find materials to make a whip. Doesn't sound very meek and mild, Jesus. And maybe that's how some of us think of Jesus as the meek and mild Galilean peasant who just floats around on a cloud, who just speaks in King James English and pronounces things eloquently like Shakespeare. Or, or maybe we have a, a lowly view of Jesus where we see him as nothing but a carpenter's son. Or maybe we have a more elevated view of Jesus. We see him as a great teacher uh, a great moral teacher and rabbi, somebody worth listening to, somebody who has wisdom for the ages. But when do we stop to consider Jesus the whiplasher? Jesus, the one who makes a whip, who takes time to braid it himself with his own hands. Maybe we haven't considered the zeal of our God. Maybe we've overlooked kindness and we've mistaken it for weakness. When in reality, what we see here is Jesus demonstrating the passion, the jealousy of a God who loves us furiously, who would go to great lengths to rescue each and every one of us from people that would cause our destruction and our dismay. 
And here Jesus is grieved in his spirit and he fashions a whip. And here's what it says next, verse 15. And making a whip of cords, he drove every single one of them out of the temple. Could you imagine that scene? You've been following Jesus up to this point for two chapters, <laughs> a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks. You've heard John the Baptist say, behold, the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. You've seen Jesus turn the water to wine. At this point, you're like, man, this is amazing. But wait a second, what is he doing now? Jesus, are you making a whip? Wait, Jesus, are you cracking that whip? Oh my goodness, he's, are you driving people out of the temple? Are you tossing over tables and pouring coins out and destroying people's businesses? Jesus, what are you doing? Imagine with me for a moment that you're one of the disciples and, and this is you and you're seeing Jesus do this for the first time. What would you do? You know what this guy would do? I'd be like, oh, it's on like Donkey Kong. Let's rumble. I'd have a guy in a headlock. I'd be like, Jesus, let's do this. He'd find me in a corner just drop kicking a fool. And I... <laughs> And I wouldn't be able to say that my motivations would be pure and righteous like the Lord's. I wouldn't be able to say that I could be angry and yet without sin. And yet that's exactly what Jesus does and, and says. Which tells me this, that anger is actually an appropriate emotion and response to things that grieve the heart of God. The question is, do we allow our anger to lead us into sin? Or do we allow our anger to be expressed righteously? Now, hear me out. I'm not suggesting that any of you go and fashion a whip next time you're righteously angry. But what I am suggesting is that we consider the example of our Messiah. That we consider the example of a God who so jealously, passionately, zealously loves us that he would rather drive those forces from our life with a whip than allow those things to take up residence within our hearts. And that's what we see Jesus doing here. As C.S. Lewis writes in the Chronicles of Narnia, referring to Aslan, the lion and Christ figure in the story, safe, who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Jesus isn't safe, but he is good. And his goodness, hear me on this, his goodness must always be interpreted in light of his zeal. When we separate Jesus' goodness from his zeal, we miscategorize, categorize. We mischaracterize and categorize the Lord. We place our definitions upon him rather than receive his definitions for himself. We, we celebrate the parts of him that make us feel all good and cozy inside. Oh, Jesus, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Mm. But what about when he brings the whip? What about when he comes with a rebuke and a challenge for us? Do we blame the devil? Oh, that's just the voice of the devil. Do we try to ignore it? Do we try to pacify it? Do we try to use language that softens the blow? That's what our culture's doing right now. That's what people that are teaching the word of God are doing right now. But Jesus isn't safe. He's good. And he's zealous for you. And that should be good news to you because it means that his heart beats for you which means that you're always on his mind. Like a husband who loves his wife. I love my wife, Candace, but it doesn't even compare to the kind of furious love that the father has for you and for me. You see, Jesus is zealous for his bride. He's zealous for the house of God. He isn't safe, but he's always good. And here he is during Passover demonstrating that jealous passion and that zeal that he has for the Father's house. 
Make no mistake, friends, it is the Father's house. It's his. It belongs to him. He set the plans and the design and purpose for it in place. He did so because his intention was to showcase his glory. His intention was to demonstrate his goodness and his zeal for his people. Can you see why Jesus might be so consumed about it? Can you see why he was so jealously passionate about it? Here's what Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 23 through 24 says, an echo of this. Take care lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make a carved image, the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. Don't do that. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire and a jealous God. He's a consuming fire, folks. He's a jealous God. He loves us with jealous passion. And he won't share his glory with another. Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another. In other words, I don't like to share my wife. I don't like to share my bride. I don't like to share the things that are mine, that belong to me. He's fiercely jealous and protective of his people, of his temple, of his glory. And this is good news for us because we now, as the New Testament church, have been grafted into Israel. We now are the temple of God in the earth, the place where his spirit longs to abide. And he's just as fiercely and, and jealously passionate and protective of us. He cares about you. He cares about your body. He cares about the choices you make and what you do with your body, which is why what you do with your body absolutely matters to God. It's why your sexuality matters to God. It's why the choice you make to honor him or not carry tremendous weight in your life. Listen to what the Holy Spirit says to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12 through 20. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. In other words, some things might be okay to do, but they're not good for you. They don't help you. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by them. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And everybody said, amen. But God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and he'll also raise us up by his own power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Do you guys not know that your bodies are united with Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ, he says, and make them members of a prostitute? That's strong language. Never! Or do you know that he who is joined to, be a, to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. Verse 17, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. So flee, verse 18, and this is great advice for everyone. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin is a sin that a person commits outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against their own body. I thought all sin was the same, Pastor Jason. Not if we take scripture seriously, class. Let me say it again. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. This is the only one that happens inside the body. Verse 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and God is, is zealous for it. He's jealously passionate over it and over what you do to it. Because if you've put your faith, hope, and trust in Jesus, your life is no longer your own. Your body is no longer your own. Husbands, when you get married to your wife, wife, when you get married to your husband, your body is no longer your own. You have submitted it to the other in trust that they're going to cherish and love and respect and care for it. Amen? And the Lord said that it was good. Amen? And in the same way, we were bought with a price, the price being Jesus' own blood that he shed for us on that cross. God paid a high price to adopt us into his family, to bring us in. 
And he says, your body is not yours to do with it whatever the heck you want. This runs in the face of everything that's being preached in our culture today. Every movie has an agenda, and it's this. Be yourself, do what you want. Your body is your own. Who, who's in a place of authority to tell you otherwise? As Christ followers, our answer is God. Because he made it. And he didn't just make it, he redeemed it. And he bought it with the price of his son's blood shed on that old rugged cross for you and for me. So glorify God in your body, Paul says. Now, why is this important to us? Why is this relevant to the discussion about the zeal that Jesus was consumed with and the zeal that you and I are called to have? It's relevant because Jesus, in his zeal, in his righteous demonstration of jealous passion for you and for me, demonstrated that he wants you and you alone. He doesn't want to share you with another. He doesn't want to share your body with another. He doesn't want to share your soul with another. He doesn't want to share your appetites and desires and dreams with another. He wants all of you. He wants every single aspect of you and of me. And if that offends you, then you haven't yet surrendered your life to him. He isn't Lord. He might be Savior, but he isn't Lord. You see, the mistake we make when we come to Jesus is we want you to save us, forgive us, cleanse us, and wash us, but we don't want you to tell us what to do with our body and with our choices. That still kind of belongs to us. Jesus, you can move into my heart, but this room is off limits. This room is for me. But isn't that what we do sometimes? We relegate God to certain compartments of our life because we still want to retain control, because we want to be the master of our domain. We want to be in charge. We want to be able to do what we want, when we want, with who we want. And this is the great tragedy of our time because we've been told over and over and over in every love story, in every song, in every Instagram post, in every commercial, in everything that we see and, and are inundated with that life is all about us. And this couldn't be further from the truth. As we prepare to close, I want to drive this point home by asking us to consider what does it mean to be zealous for the things that Jesus is zealous for? What does it mean to be zealous for the things that Jesus is zealous for? So I want to talk to us and pivot here about what it means to have a zeal for God's house. We see it actually in Luke's account of this same exact story. We see it in Luke chapter 19, verse 46. And here's what it says, and I'm going to read it to you. He said to them, this is Jesus, he said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. What does it mean to have a zeal for the things that Jesus has a zeal for? What does it mean to have a zeal for God's house, for his temple, for his people, for the church? That's what we're talking about. Number one, it means we honor what God honors. We honor what God honors. Jesus honored the authority of God's word. Do you see it right here? I boldened it for you. Jesus said to them, the scriptures declare... He didn't say Mark Zuckerberg declares. He didn't say CNN or Fox News declares. He didn't say our president declares. No, Jesus said to them, go back, Liam. Jesus said to them, the scriptures declare. Jesus honored the authority of God's word and he declared God's word and he submitted to God's word because he was the word. That's why at Courageous Church, we honor the teaching of God's word. We submit to its authority. These aren't just good ideas to live by. These aren't just principles for a better you. This is the eternal, authoritative, inspired, God-breathed word of God. And we honor it. We place it in high value in our life. We submit to it. 
and we esteem those who bring the word and who teach the word. The Bible says they are worthy of honor because it's not their word, it's God's word. It's his design. It's his passion. It's his zeal. So we honor what God honors. Number two, we value what God values. Next slide, Liam. Number two, we value what God values. Listen to what goes on to say. He said to them, the scriptures declare in the very next phrase, my temple or my house or my people will be a house of prayer. Jesus valued prayer above all things. That's why we value prayer above all things. I told our Be Courageous class today, we are passionate about prayer and we pray every Tuesday night at seven, not because it's something we add on to our schedule, but because it is our schedule, because it is the chief activity. It is the priority of Jesus for his house, for his people, that we would be called a house of prayer, that we would be a people zealously and jealously passionate about prayer. Why? Because Jesus was. So much so that he cracked the whip. So much so that he formed a whip. That's why as a church, we do this every Tuesday. We do so to minister to the heart of God and to partner with him and what he wants to accomplish here on earth. So we value what God values. And then number three, we protect what God wants protected. Here's what it goes on to say. He said to them, the scriptures declare my temple or my house will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Why do we protect what God wants protected? Because Jesus did. He cracks the whip over this. He drives out the den of thieves that wanted to take up residence in the house of God. That's why as pastors, Candace and I have a responsibility and a burden before God to be protective over what happens in this place and over what happens in your life and over the kinds of relationships that that are formed. We don't want the enemy to come in to steal and kill and destroy from you. We don't want the enemy to slip in the back row and to begin to divert and distract and destroy your life. That's why as under shepherds, as pastors of Courageous Church, this is our primary obligation that we have to make sure that this place doesn't become a den of thieves, a place that welcomes sheep and, and that welcomes wolves in sheep clothing. So don't be surprised if you hear Pastor Jason or Candace or even Jim crack the whip every once in a while. Don't, don't be scared. Don't be nervous. I'm not going on a power trip. No, I'm trying to protect the flock. And there may be people that join us in this adventure, in this journey that we're on, that come in with the wrong agenda. And they're not here for for the right reasons. There are actually people that will come in with evil reasons that want to hurt you. And my job is not to feed them and care for them and tell them how lovely they are. My job is to shoot them dead. In the spirit, that is. (laughs) Don't worry, I'm not packing. It's okay. Everybody relax. But I will say this, okay? It takes a village. Every one of us in the body of Christ has a responsibility to protect what God wants protected. That means when you guys come in here, have your heads on a swivel, please. Don't come in with with blinders on your eyes and just go to your seat and sit down and make it all about you. No, be protectors of God's house. Be people that are aware of what's happening in situations, conversations, and relationships that take place in this place. Why? Because we want to protect what God wants protected Jesus doesn't want thieves to come in. That's not his heartbeat for us. So church, let's be zealous about the things of God together. Let's be zealous for God's house. Let's honor what God wants honored. Let's value what God wants valued and let's protect what he wants protected, amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, for the challenge, for the encouragement, Lord, even for the rebuke. Lord, thank you for your zeal for us. God, may we be a people that are zealous for you. May we be like David and your son Jesus, consumed with zeal for your house. Oh God, when we come in here, may we look around and just be so excited and exuberant and energized and enthusiastic and ardently passionate for the people. God, may we look with your eyes and see with your heart what it is that you want for us in the days ahead. God, I know it's good 
But Lord, may we never detach your zeal from your goodness because they go together hand in hand. Lord, may our lives bear a jealous witness for who you are. May we not despise those that despise us and return insult upon injury, God. May we not be caught off guard by people that don't understand our zeal, don't understand why we're so passionate about this thing called Courageous Church, why we're so passionate about Jesus, why we're so passionate about the Spirit, why we're so passionate about doing the work of ministry. God, may, may we not be discouraged when people don't get us. And may we not be discouraged, Lord, when they look down upon us or, or label us or call us fools for being so. Just like David, Lord, we're going to dance before you. We're going to worship before you. We're going to pray like there's no tomorrow. And we're going to honor the things that you want honored. We're going to value the things that you want valued. And Lord God, we're going to protect and guard the things that you want guarded. So I pray for every person in this place today that they would have a zeal for your house.